Welcome to Health Politics with Dr. Mike McGee, a weekly program exploring important trends in health. U.S. stem cell critics are now one step closer to falling off the logic cliff. They started out pretty close to the edge, supporting President Bush's position that only a limited number of lines of stem cells produced before August 9, 2001 would be eligible for federal funding support. And they held their ground even as these lines proved insufficient and stimulated a stem cell brain drain overseas. Then over the summer, they cheered loudly as the president vetoed legislation that would have expanded federal financing for U.S. research. But now they've gone too far. New events have carried this alliance made up of a select few anti-stem cell scientists and a much larger array of conservative religious leaders to new heights of irrationality. A study released in the journal Nature in August 2006 by researchers of advanced cell technology describes a procedure that has been used to launch a stem cell line without ill effect to the embryo. The new approach is modeled after a procedure that has been used successfully in fertility clinics for 10 years. In fertility clinics, the procedure involves taking a single blastomere cell from an eight-cell embryo for genetic testing to exclude conditions like Down syndrome prior to the implantation of the now seven-cell structure into the mother. The procedure has successfully yielded more than 2,000 healthy infants in the United States over the past 10 years. Researchers have found that in mice, this same technique, extracting a single cell from an eight-cell embryo, has yielded stem cell cultures without destruction of the remaining seven blastomere cells. Dr. Robert Lanza, the lead on this new study, says that the same can be done with human blastomeres. Now, logic would dictate that religious-based opponents of stem cell research would view this development as positive. As Ronald Green, an ethicist from Dartmouth, told the New York Times, he hopes the method, quote, provides a way of ending the impasse about federal funding for this research, close quotes. But critics aren't budging. Leon Cass, favored scientist of the administration and former chair of the President's Council on Bioethics, says, quotes, I do not think that this is the sought-for, morally unproblematic, and practically useful approach we need, close quotes. A White House spokeswoman, Emily Lorimore, was reported to concur, suggesting this would not satisfy the president's concerns. Her words outflank scientific progress. Quotes, any use of human embryos for research purposes raises serious ethical concerns, close quotes. Interesting. I thought the issue was with harming or destroying the embryos because they deserve the same respect and privilege as human subjects. Following that logic, if no harm is done, and with the permission of the embryo's donors or parents, shouldn't the embryo be allowed to contribute to research in order to assist others with chronic disease? Shouldn't the embryo be allowed to help uncover the truths that would eliminate these diseases altogether? No, says Richard Dorflinger, Deputy Director of the Pro-Life Activities of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. It's more than that. According to him, the Roman Catholic Church is against all in vitro fertilization, in part because devoid of sexual intercourse, it makes the output procreation, quotes, more a product of manufacture than a gift. The technician does not love this child, has no personal connection with this child, and with every IVF procedure, he or she may be more and more used to the idea of the child as manufacture, close quotes. So it's not about the soul of the embryo or that of the embryo's parents, but rather about the soul of the scientist? Other moral objections include those of Kansas Senator Sam Brombeck. His spokesperson told the New York Times, quotes, you're creating a twin and then killing the twin, close quotes. Really? Experts say twins arise at a later point in embryonic development. So given these types of arguments, I'm just not getting it. 
Maybe we should start again from the very beginning. Woman's egg meets man's sperm. Sperm penetrates egg, fertilizes it, and the cell divides. One cell becomes two cells. Two cells become four cells. Four cells become eight cells. That's three divisions with eight blastomere cells all outside of the uterus as the fertilized egg is engulfed by and drops down through the fallopian tube. If the eight blastomere cells are in vitro, one cell may be removed to check for genetic problems. The remaining seven-cell embryo does just fine, continues to develop into a multi-cell blastocyst with an outer layer, an inner mass of cells, and an expanding inside chamber. From here, three things can happen to this blastocyst embryo. Under normal circumstances, the next step would be for the embryo to implant itself in the uterus or to be implanted during a fertility procedure. Absent miscarriage, it will go on to successfully develop into a fetus. Option two, if the embryo was developed for the in vitro fertilization process but was never implanted in the uterus, it will eventually be discarded or destroyed. And thirdly, in typical stem cell development procedures, if the blastocyst embryo is used as a source of stem cells, the procedure would generally lead to the loss of the embryo. Now this is where the new procedure comes in. Some parents, utilizing the in vitro fertilization and concerned about genetic defects, allow fertility experts to withdraw one cell from an eight-cell embryo for genetic testing. This destroys the one cell, but the seven cells grow and differentiate normally. Using a similar approach in mice, scientists have succeeded in extracting a single cell from an eight cell embryo to successfully create a stem cell line. And once again, the seven cell embryo has gone on to develop normally. Now, researchers say the same can be achieved in humans. Their success remains to be confirmed by other researchers. And there are legitimate debates about whether this approach can be efficient and effective, and whether or not it's applicable for exploration of specific diseases like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. But this is science. I know many people will continue to be troubled by the ethical dimensions and religious implications of science colliding with creation but it is high time to once again, let science be science, let religion be religion, and to publicly challenge all those who would deliberately confuse the two. For Health Politics, I'm Mike McGee. Thank you for watching Health Politics with Dr. Mike McGee. If you're accessing Health Politics with a portable device, please visit our homepage, healthpolitics.org, for more information on this topic and many others. If you're watching Health Politics on the Internet, please visit the links below for additional information. Download the transcript and slides to share with friends or colleagues, or use the discussion guide to help generate conversations in the classroom. If you are not yet a Health Politics subscriber and would like to begin receiving a weekly email to keep you up to date on our latest programs, please click on Subscribe to Health Politics above and enter your email address. Again, thank you for watching Health Politics with Dr. Mike McGee.